Amen. Amen. God bless you. Um, things are speeding up. And I believe that God has increased the pace of which he is answering prayers. One scripture talks about that before you ask, I will answer. Hallelujah. That God knows that what we need before we even ask. And by the time it gets out of our mouth, the Lord says the answer is already on the way. And uh, so <clears throat> something that's been in my spirit, I, I, we're going to read three different passages of Scripture today. We're going to start out of the book of Isaiah 59. We're then going to go to Matthew 24, and we will end in 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, there's so much that God has done this month, and I cannot wait to share with you uh, what the Lord has, has already done for us. This is going to be the greatest year that Regeneration Nashville has ever seen. Amen. And uh, my, my, the Lord is faithful. So out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, and... Uh, Verse 18, according to their deeds, accordingly he will repay. Fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. This is the part that I want to extract. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Hallelujah. Now let's go over to the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 24. This is one of my favorite chapters because it has so much in it about the hour that we're living in. Verse 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. People who bought the book, 88 Reasons Why Christ is Coming in 1988, didn't read this verse. <laughs> verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then let's go over to First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 20. Which sometimes were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Um, I want to. I want to talk about the flood. Uh, floods. There's no warning. How many remember the flood that we had a few years ago here? I think they called it the 500-year flood. Uh, I remember it vividly. Uh, on a Sunday morning, I had gotten up, got my clothes on, was walking downstairs into my garage to get into the car and go to the old 
uh, place for church. And when I opened my door, water rushed into my house. And, of course, I began to realize right then this was not a normal Sunday morning. And by the time it was over, there were houses floating down Briley Parkway. There was the Opryland Mall was gone. The Opryland Hotel had over 13 feet of water in it. And it took years to recover from that devastating flood. There are seasons in our life where we feel like that there is a flood that hits us from the enemy. We can generally navigate being a believer when just every once in a while something out of the ordinary happens and we're able to to navigate that time period and we were able to overcome and come out of it. But I'm going to tell you, there are also times where it seems like the enemy empties his magazine. This ain't just a shot. It's like the enemy dug down and he said, I'm all in. And takes every chip he has on the table. Don't email me on that. And puts it all in and hits you with everything that he's got. And it's in that season that whatever you were doing the months of the year before would determine how you come out of that. Because if you're waiting to do something to deal with the flood after the flood hits, it's going to win. So the, we're going to go back to Genesis here now, and the Scripture is talking about this. It says that God looks down on the earth, and he repents that he has made man because there is so much wickedness in the earth. When you make God repent, you've gone a long ways. It literally means he was sorry. He changed his mind. And the Scripture says that he looks down and he finds Noah, who is a preacher of righteousness, and he warns him. Why didn't he warn other people? Because nobody else would have believed him. Only Noah would. Because Noah understood righteousness. And there is a warning that's been going out in the atmosphere for a few years in this nation that something's getting ready to happen. That there is judgment coming. That life is not normal. Get ready. There is cataclysmic change coming. But when you are not in tune with God, you cannot hear what the Spirit is saying. And Noah believed the Lord. And God told him, he said, here's what's going to happen. He said, I'm going to send a flood. And I'm going to destroy everything that breathes on the earth. Then he said, for you to survive, you've got to do it my way. And he gives him the dimensions and the plans for building an ark. And Noah believes the Lord. And he begins to build something that looks like it is not necessary. Many, many people today believe the way we have church is not necessary. That coming to prayer meeting for a couple of hours on, and every night of the week is not necessary. But you know what the scripture said about Noah? It said that he was building a salvation. He was building for something that he didn't fully understand. You have to remember, Noah didn't know what rain was. It had never rained in, on the earth on anybody. A mist came up out of the ground and watered the earth. So when God said, I'm going to cause it to rain, Noah probably said, what is rain? God said, I'm going to open the heavens and water is going to come out of the heavens. And he said, it's going to come in a deluge. And he said, I'm going to bring it to a level that it destroys everything on the earth. 
one day without warning, without any indicators, people sobering up from another night of debauchery, people that were in all kinds of sin the day before, wake up that morning and something that has never, ever happened before is now taking place. And if you could have saw it, they're walking outside and they're going, what is this? Because for the first time, adults are experiencing rain. The sun is not shining. The sky is black. There is a thunderous noise in the atmosphere, and it begins to change how people feel. And Noah has finished his ark. And the Bible said that day that God began to open the heavens and water began to come out of the heavens. And he said the deep opened up in the earth and water began to come up out of the ground. And all of a sudden, after a few hours, you can't see dry land. People are walking around with their ankles covered with water. There is terror. Nobody wants to go to the bar. Nobody wants to party. Nobody's going to the Mercedes dealership looking for a new vehicle. Nobody's thinking about going on vacation. Something has happened that's never happened before. Can I tell you, there is an event getting ready to hit the earth that nobody saw coming. No theologian and no preacher and no prophet really knows what God's up to. It's only by the Spirit that you just simply believe. God said it. I believe it. That's final and that's enough for me. And a flood hit the earth. It was created by God. By the time God was done There were thousands of feet of water. The mountains were covered. There's lots of debate. Was this a flood that only covered the part of the Middle East? I think the scripture says it covered the whole earth, so I believe that. I believe the entire earth was covered with water. And the only life is what's floating in a boat that faith built. The beauty of this, if you can find it, is that the flood was controlled by God. It was not out of God's control. One day, when God looked down and he said, it's enough, and he just spoke a word, the heavens dried up, the earth closed up. And slowly, water began to abate. We go to the book of Matthew now, and this isn't one of the disciples. This is Jesus talking. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, he said, it's going to happen again. He said, They were eating and drinking and marrying and all of that. And he said they knew not until the day the flood came that it was going to happen. Human beings generally want indicators before they will respond. There are always some men who are able to see ahead. The depression was horrible for so many people, and yet it made some people very wealthy. The Lord says that the same setting that was back then is going to be when the Lord comes back. The Scripture says this, when the enemy comes in like a flood, he's not a flood. Why? Because only God can create a flood. The enemy cannot create. He can only counterfeit. 
So when you read the story of the flood, you say flood, it terrifies people. You can go look at a beautiful piece of property and you can't figure out why it's so cheap until you go to the planting and you find out it's in a flood zone. People take a gamble and they think, well, there had not been any flood in 100 years. We're going to build it. And then two years later, all of a sudden, our house has got three feet of water in it. The Lord says, he says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, Can I tell you that we are in a season in the earth where the devil has thrown in everything that he's got. We are not dealing with isolated incidents. We are dealing with a pandemic of sin that is in every nation on the face of the earth. We are dealing with a flood of sin like you have never seen. We are dealing with the most idiotic crazy mentality where evil has become good and good has become evil where people with degrees are embracing every stupid idea that you can think of what in the world is going on hell has put all its chips on the table and it's declaring I'm going after the church I'm going after humanity with everything that I got because I am going to win And so now, the Lord said it. He said, before I come back, it's going to look like Noah's generation. You know, this idea that you you hear people say, well, everything is, electricity is going to be gone and you know, we won't be able to have gasoline and everybody's going to be housebound. There's not going to be any food. That's not what the scripture says. It says they were eating and drinking and partying. That doesn't sound like there was a lack of anything. When the devil wants his way, he will make provision. And right now we're in a season where there is a flood that has come against the people of the Lord. And all of a sudden, we're seeing our children being taken over by the enemy. And we're seeing confusion on sexual identity. I never dreamed that we would be dealing as a church with some of the issues that we are dealing with. I thought we'd deal with pornography and unforgiveness and alcohol and heroin addiction. That's not what we're dealing with. We're dealing with some of the most ridiculous sayings that you have ever seen. What is that? There is a flood of hell that has been released least against the house of God. But the Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, he ain't a flood, but, but when he comes in like a flood, what happens? God doesn't say, sorry guys, I don't know what to do. The scripture says God steps up on the edge of nothing, raises up a standard against it and declares, not on my watch, not today, not in this house, not on your life. This is a standard of God. This church is still standing, even though we've been in a flood zone. Hallelujah. The enemy's sown everything that it can against us. And I want to go on record that we're grateful to Cornerstone for being able to be in this house. But the enemy, hallelujah, the enemy doesn't like righteousness. But we are still breathing. We are still alive. We are still seeing people filled with the Holy Ghost. We are still seeing the miraculous. Go ahead, enemy. Do your best. But when the dust is settled, there will be a standard uh, that has been raised up by the power of God. (laughs) Hallelujah. Some declare that the standard is a war flag. I like the way Spurgeon described it. He said it's the cross. 
Hallelujah. That when the enemy comes in like a flood to literally devastate and wipe you out. Hallelujah. God holds up the cross and says at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith that I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. Can I tell you, I'm here to give you some good news. It doesn't matter who's in control. It doesn't matter who's making the laws. When the dust is settled, there will be a standard still raised in the atmosphere where God says it shall not be. Why would the devil use a flood? I think because he thought it worked. Because he copies God. And when he saw God wanted to wipe out humanity, God used a flood. So the devil thought, well, if it works for God, it'll work for me. So he has duplicated that. The problem for the devil is he doesn't have control of it. Government is not in control of nations. God is. We believe in government. We believe in submission. We believe praying for our leaders. But when the writer said pray for those who are leaders, he was assuming that their leadership was predicated on the Bible. I will not pray for leaders that vote for abortion. I'll pray against you, but I sure ain't praying for you. I'm not going to say, oh, God, just bless them and give them fruit in their life. I'm going to go after them and say, God, with the same curse that they put on the unborn, put it back on them in the name of Jesus. Somewhere you got to get on one side or the other and draw the line. We are not of those who draw back. God, give me some men and women that got enough guts in them to stand up at any cost and declare, as for me and my our house, we will serve the Lord. If the devil wants war, we will give him war. He ain't never seen anybody like an apostolic, Holy Ghost, God filled church that believes in the power of the word of the Lord and the blood of the Lamb. So a lot of believers, you know, they get discouraged in this hour because of what they're seeing. But the Lord was very plain. He said, when he comes in like a flood, not just a little attack. How many can look back and really say, I have survived the flood in my life? Boy, I have. It makes me so grateful to God when I can look back and you can look back and say if it had not been for the Lord when I'm overwhelmed lead me to the rock that is higher than I when this little preacher sat with a gun cocked to his head so devastated with life, the Lord stepped in and said, not today. Hallelujah. When some of you looked like it was over and there was no hope, but the Lord said, here's the standard and held it up to the enemy and said, not today. Hallelujah. Can I declare to you today that God is on your side. He is in control. He laughs at the counsel of the wicked and he brings the wisdom of nations to naught by the power of God so when you read in first Peter scripture is talking about in the days of Noah said the long suffering of God he waited you don't really think in terms of God waiting God looks down in Noah's day and it bothered him so much. Finally, he just said, I'm done. And he released a flood of death 
we have no idea the magnitude of what took place there. That as this, I think that one of the reasons that God put a window only in the top of the ark was so Noah couldn't look out at all the dead bodies that were floating. Because Noah was a man of mercy. Because the scripture calls him a preacher of righteousness. And you can't be full of bitter and, and, and hatefulness and anger and still preach righteousness. And while that ark is floating that Noah has built all of the death, the animals and babies and old people, bodies bloated, and yet Noah couldn't see it because he was encased, hallelujah, in what he built by faith. The word of the Lord today through my son was about that. It will be different for Goshen than it is Egypt. God will take care of you. But I find it interesting that it says that while Noah was building the ark, God waited in long suffering. God was suffering. It was painful to him to see what his creation had become. And it said he waited. <clears throat> There's a scripture that talks about because judgment is not executed speedily. People misinterpret God. But see, God in his mercy will wait to the longest moment that needs to be before he will say it's enough. And where, where we are right now, I mean, we prayed so much as a church in this nation and in the other nations that God would intervene. Don't ever think that you're going to waltz away from that one for free. Whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. And I also know this by the Spirit, that Haman's gallows is getting ready to have somebody hung on it in the Spirit. You can't build execution for righteous people and innocent people and think God is going to stand to the sidelines and just say, sorry, you're on your own. No, sir, somewhere God is raising up a standard in this atmosphere, and he's saying, no. Why would God wait in Noah's time? Because God honored the faith of Noah, and he knew if I send the flood before the ark's finished, Noah will perish. So he withheld judgment and let that generation go against him, blaspheme him, live in sin and perversion as he watched. One scripture says the eyes of the Lord cannot look on sin. I think that God, to some degree, just has to do this because it's so painful for such a righteous God to look on sin. But the day that came when the last nail got pounded and the last board, and you know what made the ark float? And this is what has to happen to the church because there's so much hatred in the church right now and so much to me. We don't have to worry about politicians. Christians are killing themselves. We are devouring one another. And when he finished the ark, the Lord looked at Noah. He said, one more thing you got to do for this ark to survive what's coming. He said, get you some pitch. And coat the whole ark with pitch. And when I looked up the word pitch, it means to pardon and to forgive. A church that is not covered with a spirit of forgiveness. 
and a spirit of pardon will never stay afloat in the time of judgment. Do we hate sin? Yes, we do. But we sure love the people that God's getting ready to bring in in the name of the Lord. May we never be a hateful church. May we never revel in the judgment on the wicked. May we never talk about people roasting in hell. But may we say, Lord, yet I, hallelujah, not Christ, but Lord, use me for thy glory. That, oh, I was a sinner, and yet Christ loved me. I have a feeling that the waiting period for God is up. And so the Lord, this, this judgment, this flood of hell that was coming against the church. Uh, I think we would all agree that nobody saw what's happened in the last couple of years coming. I mean, there weren't... There just weren't that many prophetic words about, thus saith the Lord, you know, it's, this is what's going to happen. We know in part and we see in part. But the thing that astounds me the most about the last three years is how fast it happened. We never dreamed it could happen this fast. I walked into, I forget where it was, a, a business and... Um, I think it was Home Depot. And I, I bought a couple of items, and I walked up, and uh, no, it was Publix. And um, there was a self-checkout, and they got, you know, those six different little registers and stuff. And, and um, I, I, I checked out, and I went to pay, and I'm trying to figure out where to put my cash. And then I walked over to another one, and, and there's no place. And finally, the lady came over, I said, how do I pay for my stuff? Where do I put my cash? He said, we don't take cash. It's our new policy. And I wanted to hold up a bill and say, legal tender. <laughs> but it's how rapidly the evolution. You know what it is? It's a flood. There is a flood of change coming. It is the enemy. You would have never dreamed that your five-year-old granddaughter doesn't know whether she's a boy or a girl. You would have never dreamed that ministers would stand on a platform and say, we're woke. That we now believe in abortion. We now believe in homosexuality. My God, your dad was a Holy Ghost Pentecostal preacher. And you've now flip-flopped to the point that you are advancing the agenda of hell. We are not woke in this church. Hallelujah. We are Bible-believing, apostolic, Holy Ghost-filled men and women that believe from front to back the word of the Lord. We will shut the doors before we will ever embrace hell's evil agenda and lies. We are the answer to this generation. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. We'll introduce you to the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and God will change your life. Can't get any plainer than that. And people are saying, I just want to go back to normal. You don't go back to normal after a flood. What you are dealing with right now is there is a flood of sin that has hit the world. It is covering everything. So many times over the years when something devastating has happened, it's generally confined to one nation. Or one part of, a, of, of, of the United States. Not this time. It hit every nation immediately. That shows you how the devil thought that I can throw in everything that I've got and win. 
So you say, Pastor, then, you know, how are we going to get out of this? Psalms 29.10 says, the Lord sits as king on the flood forever. He controls everything. And this flood of sin, God's going to deal with it. I'm going to give you a verse for it in Revelations chapter 12. Revelations chapter 12, verse 15, and the serpent, who the Bible calls the devil, cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman who's the church, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. When you read this, theologians all say this, this flood is an unprecedented release of sin. That the serpent opens his mouth and releases a flood of sin. When I was a boy, even people that didn't go to church were more spiritual than most people that go to church now. It's true. Even guys didn't go to church tithed. They had, there was a reverence and a fear of the Lord. One of the things that amazes me is there's no fear of the Lord anymore in the earth. Watch comedians. Listen to the liberal media attack the Lord Jesus Christ. I love what Pastor Harry said when, by the way, I don't know if we released what he did on Wednesday night, a couple Wednesday nights ago, but it was powerful. And he said, it's amazing to me that the Muslim world isn't having a problem with sexual identity with their kids. Neither is China. It's the United States. Why? Because the United States is a gate to the nations. And if you can get that kind of perversion loose, then we'll never touch the Muslim world. So the Bible says that we're coming into an age, and we're seeing this now, that he is released out of his mouth, a flood after the church. Verse 16, and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had cast out of his mouth. This is what we're getting ready to see. That God supernaturally, hallelujah, boy, I feel this strong in the spirit. God supernaturally is getting ready to open up the earth. Say, we can't do that. Ask Cora about that. That is one of the most amazing stories. You know, you got 200 and some guys that challenge Moses. And the moment that Moses said, y'all stand over there and we'll stand over here, that would have made me nervous. <laughs> then God says, now watch. And the Bible said, the earth opened up, swallowed them and their household, then closed back up. And all Israel standing going, There is something that only heaven can do. God is getting ready to raise up a standard in the United States, and not just in the United States, but in every country in the earth. God is going to swallow up, hallelujah, this flood. Only God can wipe out humanity, not the devil. He can go after individuals, but he can't wipe out the church. Why? Because the church. No wonder God uses the marriage between man and woman as an analogy for the church. Say, Pastor, why is the church going to make it? Because the church is the bride of Christ. 
And Jesus loves the bride or the wife as himself. And the man is to be the protector of the weaker vessel. So Jesus, using that analogy, because he was the protector of the church. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, our husband is going to stand up and declare a word in the atmosphere that says, you are not going to touch my wife. Hallelujah. I can tell you by the Spirit of the Lord, this abuse that's come against the church is going to come to an end, saith the Lord. And God is going to cause the earth to open up and this deluge of sin and filth, the Lord said, I'm going to swallow it. Very interesting that it's called the serpent and then the earth swallows it. Takes you all the way back to Moses. Where Moses throws down his rod. And the magicians throw down their rods. And you got snakes. I would have been out of there right then. I would have never let Israel, because the moment God turned out my rod into a snake, I would have been 50 yards down the road. <laughs> and the Lord said, pick it up. I go, you pick it up. <clears throat> I can handle leprosy, not the snake. But with those snakes crawling around, the Bible said that Moses' rod just went over and went, Whoa. Start swallowing snakes. And then God said, now pick it. You can pick it back up. I guess it's Aaron, but when he picked it back up, it became a rod. Here's the beauty of it. His rod now possesses the authority of the magicians. And the Bible says from that day on, they could not duplicate Miracles, because the rod of the leader had overpowered it. Now, this flood is coming to an end. The enemy used it because he, used, he knew God used flood for death, so he thought, I'll use it for death. In this instance, the Bible says that God is going to stop this flood that's in the earth And then there's going to be another flood. And we're going to end on this. Habakkuk 2.14 says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Joel, the second chapter, which is a prophetic chapter about the dispensation of grace. He said, you've known what it was to have the former rain in the autumn and the latter rain in the spring. But he said, there is a flood coming out of heaven of the glory of the Lord. And he said, I'm going to take the former rain and the latter rain, and I'm going to put it together. And as the waters cover the seas, so shall the knowledge of the glory of the Lord cover the earth. And God is saying in this hour, my first flood was for death, but my last flood is for life. And he said, I'm getting ready to release a flood of the presence and of the glory of God that's going to hit every nation, every continent. Hallelujah. By the power of the glory of the Lord, we're not going to have to deal with restrictions. We're not going to have to deal with the Supreme Court. We're not going to have to deal with evil men that say you can't do that. But the earth is going to swallow up what they did. And God said, hallelujah, there is a flood, a flood, a flood coming as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man that I'm going to release out of the earth. Hallelujah. The glory and the majesty of the power of God. 
David said, though I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Part of the flood where the Lord deals with with the enemy is he opens the earth and swallows it. But as it was in the days of Noah, out of the earth begin to come water. And God, hallelujah, where he buries hell, he's going to loose the glory. And up out of the earth is going to come a breaking forth of the majesty and of the power of God. No wonder he said, the reason I'm giving the wealth of the wicked is because the church will never ever have to worry about money, says the Lord. There's going to be such a wave of maturity and righteousness. I'm going to give you so much. Much says God, but because you've matured in me, it will not sidetrack you. It will not make you fall in love with it, but you'll use it for the glory of the Lord. You have no idea, says God, of what's getting ready to happen, but there is a coming release of a flood. Not a trickle, but a flood. Now, out of Azusa Street came one of the greatest moves of God called Ladder Rain. Arms growing out. One of our precious saints in this church had an ATV accident here about a week ago and had her arm completely cut off. And I stood beside her bed in the hospital, and we did communion together. And I prayed over her, and she said, Pastor Kent, it was amazing, her faith. She said, Pastor Kent, when I came to, and I knew my arm was gone, the first thing I thought of was you preaching about God's going to make limbs grow back again. And I thought... I told the Lord, I'd stand over bed. I told her, I said, you ain't never going to have a better opportunity than right now. And in my prayer time, I've been, I've been reaching down deep. Somewhere we got to have to have the faith. Maya Baba Sunday. Hallelujah. If it happened in the latter rain, then it has to happen now. That was about 100 years back. Now the Lord says, there's another rain coming. But he said, it's not just the latter rain, but it's the former and the latter rain combined. That there's so much coming. (laughs) Oh, I wish I could release this how I feel. it. There is so much coming, says the Lord. I've had to repent about my lack of faith for a building and my lack of faith about the, the graciousness of Cornerstone. Will you let us stay and, and just begin to tell the Lord, it's your house. They're your people. I trust you, God. You no matter where we go, I know that you got it. Is there anybody in this house today, hallelujah, that wants to release their faith in the spirit of the Lord that tells God, bring it, bring it, bring it. I, I want to give you just one more point before we end because this is such a, a great story. This is in um, Luke chapter 8. You know, it's funny because I, I'll turn on TBN and, and watch uh, these guys that uh, are teaching. I think it was... Um, Brother Alan Jackson, who pastors out in Murfreesboro, I was watching him this morning, and um, you know, it's, the whole place is full, and 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 he's teaching, and, and I'm looking, and everybody's got a notebook, everybody's got a Bible. I thought I must be doing something wrong. <laughs> How do you get people to to bring their Bible and their notebook, and they're all sitting there? And I thought, well, either I'm really boring, or I am so exciting that they just can't be able to take notes. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Um, we're doing this so I won't use a water bottle because I look a lot cooler, they say, if I drink out of this. 
Luke <clears throat> chapter 6, verse 47, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and he digged deep. And he laid the foundation on a rock. Man, there's so much in here you could preach. And the stream, or another word is flood, beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon the rock. One of the other gospels calls it a flood. And the scripture says he, dig, he dug deep. Yet when you read the rest of this story, it starts out with, and there was a foolish man who built his house on the sand. But no flood came when he finished it. Reason why is because if the flood had come when the foolish man had built a house that wasn't scripturally right, then the wise man would have perished too because his house wasn't finished. So could it be that God hath withheld judgment, not because he weeks at sin, but because he's waiting for the church to finish the house on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And the moment that wise man finished his house, the Bible said, immediately came the storm and the flood and hit it with everything that it had. We're not talking about a busted pipe. We're talking about a flood, and it hit it. I mean, it's hitting the walls. Water's coming up on the windows. They're sitting inside. He looks at his wife and says, Baby, we're going to be all right. I went down deep, hallelujah. And you look through the window. The neighbor's house is floating away. But when it got all done, they're still standing. Can I tell Keep on praying. Keep on believing. Keep on holding on. Keep on declaring because we are going to survive the flood that's coming. This last flood that you and I are going to see is not a flood of judgment. It is a flood of the glory of God. He's a merciful God. He's not willing that any man should perish. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, said the Lord. Hallelujah. And it's coming. There is a wave. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how it's going to come. I don't know how God's going to use TV. And I don't know how God. But one of the things I do know, there's a whole bunch of people getting ready to be saved that were voices for the enemy's camp. <clears throat> I remember several years ago, uh, God gave me a prophetic word. And I released it to the church. And I said, the Lord said he's fixing to take a strong voice of the enemy's camp. And raise him up as a voice for the church. And right after that, Mel Gibson stepped out and made the movie The Passion that literally revolutionized people's lives. Thousands of people got saved watching that movie. And Hollywood hated it. They wouldn't fund it. So he funded it himself and made a billion dollars or somewhere around, they said, uh, close to a billion dollars. And I can guarantee you there were some studios that thought, what were we thinking? Why didn't we do this? But see, God, hallelujah, there are, there are voices. There are, I can see it in the spirit. There are singers, international singers that God's going to fill with the Holy Ghost. And they're going to stand on platforms and sing for the glory of the Lord. God is going to invade Hollywood. 
Narabobo Sunday. Hallelujah. God is going to move into the political realm. And he says, I'm going to begin to change the hearts of men. The Lord says that I'm going to appear to them at times in dreams and visions. I'm going to give them divine encounters with me, says the Lord. And I'm going to take the church that has been in the shadows, saith God, and I'm going to begin to bring her out of the shadows. And I'm going to sit her on a pedestal as a city that is set up upon a hill and I'm going to allow the whole world not to see a naked ungodly house but to see a house that's clothed with the glory of the Lord. I'm going to release billions of dollars to the kingdom of the Lord. I'm going to take entire satellite systems saith God that are orbiting the earth and I'm going to cause them to broadcast the nations to the glory of God. I'm going to do things saith the Lord that you will stay and not be able to comment because there are no words to describe what thy eyes are going to behold. I'm going to save your children. I'm going to invade your homes. I'm going to release, saith God, such a wave of divine healing at one time that it will start on one side of the globe and it will circle until the whole body of Christ has been healed by the power of God. I'm going to bind strongholds, saith God, and ancient landmarks are going to be torn down. For there is a season, saith the Lord, that there is a wave and a flood of the glory of God that is going to touch the earth. And this time it will not be for destruction, but it will be for salvation and life, saith the Lord. Stand with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I did some research on this. And I think it's in Genesis. Let me see if I have this written down because I, I found it very interesting. You know, looking back over the last several years in the United States of America, we go back and reference so much 9-11. But this is what Genesis 9-11 says. And I will establish my covenant with you, and neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, and neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. That's 9-11. Yeah. And God said the way that I'm going to remember my covenant is I'm going to set a bow in the clouds. And science says, though they, they don't have exact proof, but because of the fact that rainbows are reflectors of water, the light that's in water, they said they have to come to the conclusion that at any given time, somewhere on the earth, there is a rainbow that is visible. And God said, every time I see the bow in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that never again will I destroy mankind with water. This time, He's going to restore mankind, not with water, but a flood of life. I'm hearing my spirit. The Lord says we're thinking way too small. Boy, I'm hearing that right now. Hallelujah. God said we're thinking too small. night I was standing in Friday night and the church was just full and as we were ending prayer the spirit of God settled down as we were singing a chorus on a tape and all of a sudden man the spirit of God broke out in the building and the church rose to her feet and we began to sing this song accompanying to a tape 
and th there was such a manifested presence of the Lord that, uh, my God, and, and I had already stepped up with the mic, and finally I realized we're in a sovereign thing. I set the mic back down because I thought, I can't, I'm not going to stop this. We're going to just let God run with it. And I remember telling Eddie at the end, I said, you know, a few years ago, if I could have had a church that had this kind of presence and this amount of people, I'd have been satisfied. I'd have been happy. But I said, not now. Hallelujah. I keep telling God, I want the nations. We want the nations. They're our inheritance. I am declaring that before the Lord comes back, I will preach on every continent. My God, I feel the Spirit of the Lord. I'm telling you, you can hear the sound. Suddenly there came from heaven the sound of a rusty mighty wind. And oh, there was a flood of the glory of God. May God lose a flood on you right now. May there be a flood of the manifested presence of the Lord. May it wash away your fear, your unbelief, your discouragement, your sorrows, your pain, your sickness. And may God wash you with the water of the word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In January, while I'm talking to you, I want you to come and stand because I'm going to share, I'm going to tell you some things. In January, this church stepped into another dimension in God. And this is something that I know. You know, we've been every every night, Monday through Friday, we've been laboring in prayer at the old location. We we keep it open from seven to nine. We're not expecting everybody to come pray for two solid hours, but you know they come and go, and we pray. And some nights are harder than others. Some nights so you can just feel there's just an easy flow and then other times you can tell you're you're working. And then all of a sudden you'll see God do something. And what I've realized over the years is that when you break through in prayer and God answers something, you don't always know it. You don't know it just happened there's not a lot of times any indicator that tells you it just happened it's by faith but we broke through something hallelujah we broke through something and some of you may feel like pastor I, I don't feel like anything has changed I'm telling you it's changed it has changed you have broke through you have broke through hallelujah it's now just seen in the natural the manifestation of what God has already released in spirit we're an army hallelujah and oh my goodness when God releases this flood and I believe it's already trickled Somewhere, the little boy has already taken his finger out of the dike. And we're seeing the water begin to come through. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you, there is a dam getting ready to break. Praise God. You got something? Pray. Pray for the sick. Amen. Come on. Pretty soon, uh, we're going to have services that are just completely for divine healing we're gonna let people email and um, you 
You got to dream big. I believe that before it's over, we're going to do a healing crusade in Madison Square Gardens. Hallelujah. 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 We're going to fill up Bridgestone. Marabobo Soria Sanda. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Pastor, this is Jeannie, and she has cirrhosis of the liver. Her name's Jeannie, here from Tennessee. Amen. Amen. Hello. You? Amen. Amen. You believe God can heal? Hallelujah. You believe God's going to heal you today? Hallelujah. Give me your hands, Jeannie. Now, in the name of the Lord, God, life is in the blood. And blood goes through the liver. So in the name of... Here, put your hand where your liver is down here. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Now, God, we just call things that are not as though they already were. And in the name of the Lord, I rebuke this death sentence. Haya Baba Sunday. I command in the name of Jesus, the spirit of death, to come out of your liver. The cirrhosis, you're going to come out right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, we declare that today you are recreating, God, a brand new liver in Jeannie's body. That Lord, she's going to have great health. That God, you're going to raise her up. She's a woman that's going to be full of the Holy Ghost. And now in the name of the Lord, the spirit of fear. God, this demon spirit, Lord, that made her plan her funeral. I curse that thing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And oh, I lose, hallelujah, the power of God upon your body. In the name of the Lord, God, I put hope back in her. In Jesus' name, leave, you foul spirit of death. And oh, today, God, in thy holy name, Lord, we declare that she is healed according to the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Pastor, this is Tommy. He has cancer and Rocky Mount fever. And he said he's coming today for his healing. Hallelujah. I oh, thank you, Lord. God, we thank you that even right now, Lord, oh, Lord, you're already on him. And now, God, we loose, hallelujah, the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ to God into his body that Lord every sickness every DNA of every spirit of infirmity I cast out of your body Tommy in the name of the Lord and from this moment on God you are renewing him renewing his strength Lord that oh God he's just going to be a wall
Yeah.